Well, that's me. Yes. Well, actually, 100 to 1,000, people don't really know that exactly, but that means we have 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14 different connections in our brain. So think about it as an enormously complex network that somehow needs to be building itself. And it needs to be building itself from scratch, right? I mean, we all start as what? As a fertilized oocyte. One cell, right? That's it. The cell divides and divides and divides. And then at some point, cells divide, uh, decide, well, okay, I'm going to become a liver cell. I'm going to become a heart cell. Or I'm going to become a cell in the nervous system. And once it has made a decision, a cell that will become a cell in the nervous system, it then has to decide what type of cell in the nervous system it will become. Right? Because we have 10 to the 11 cells that make all these different connections. That means, you know, like a big car dealership that has like hundreds of cars. They're not all the same cars, right? They're very different cars. They're all cars, but they're very different, right? The same with neurons. They're essentially all neurons, meaning they have these thin projections called exons or dendrites. They make these connections. They use neurotransmitters. But essentially, they're all different from one another in terms of what exactly it is that they do. Now, I just told you a second ago that all that develops from a single cell, from a fertilized oocyte. And there's nobody, you know, from the outside who's sort of screwing around with that. It's all happening intrinsically. A cell divides, and this thing will happen no matter what. Right? There may be defects or so, but essentially, it always works the same way. What that means, essentially, is, and that's something that's pretty undisputed, is that all that stuff, all this building plan, is encoded within our genome. Right? Genome means you know, all the DNA and all these little genes that basically build the blueprint to make a nervous system. Right? So what my lab is trying to understand is, as, as with any other labs, is what exactly is the nature of this blueprint, or even better, what exactly are those individual genes that instruct cells to become this or this cell, meaning a neuron or not a neuron, or if they become a neuron, what type of a neuron do they Right, so it's a very fundamental question, how animal nervous systems develop that you study. Now, why is it important? I want to give you some sort of a medical perspective on that as well. Who knows what Parkinson's disease is? Oh man, so many hands. Okay, so who's closest? I saw you lifting your hand. No? You. <laughs> Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Before I go into more detail, do you know some famous people who suffer from Parkinson's disease? Who still live? Very good. Another one? Very good. Exactly. Okay. So now there's a very specific thing about Parkinson's patients. It's not just that you know neurons die all over and that their whole brain degenerates. It's not like that. It's only one very specific type of neurons that break stuff. Those neurons are called dopamine neurons. They're called dopamine neurons for the simple reason that they produce a neurotransmitter that's called dopamine. It's a small chemical that neurons utilize in order to talk to one another. And those dopamine neurons they have, as you already uh, uh, said in, in your answer, they have a very important function in controlling movements. And if you don't have those dopaminergic neurons anymore, those dopamine neurons, you fail to be able to control uh, how you move, everything becomes very sluggish, you know, and everything, not just in terms of your movement, also, but also the, uh, the muscle that control any aspect of your, of speaking for example, when you talk, if you hear more of it, how you talk, you know, it's very, very slow to right? It's because the huge motor problems, meaning local, uh, motor problems in terms of muscle problems that are associated with not having dopamine. So we still don't know to this day really why that is. Why is it specifically dopamine neurons that fall apart in those patients? We know that many of those patients have actually genetic defects. They have, you know, they have sort of, if you want, pulled the unlucky card, right? But then there are also those patients where Parkinson's disease is actually induced, induced by specific environmental factors. 
For example, heroin users. When you use heroin, there's a specific breakdown product in your body that gets generated that specifically attacks dopamine neurons. Again, we don't really understand why it specifically attacks dopamine neurons, but that's the way it is. So heroin users who have been lucky enough to survive their addiction and live to an uh, old age, they have a much increased chance of suffering from Parkinson's disease. Okay. So here's what people try to do to fix that. What people try to do is they either administer exogenously, meaning from the outside, dopamine to those patients. Right? Because I told you they don't have the dopamine neurons, they don't use dopamine, so you basically can just inject dopamine and then hope that those uh, those motor problems get somehow alleviated. And that works pretty well. The problem is after some time your body does not respond to that anymore. Again, we don't quite understand why that is. It's a very common feature of people that have Parkinson's disease that are treated by dopamine. So the other strategy, which is a much more modern strategy, and whether it's ever going to work, we don't know, but it's a very attractive way to do that, which is to re-implant into people that have lost their dopamine neurons fresh new dopamine. 